Hey everybody, it's Andrew, and I've been using the Galaxy Book 4 lineup. I have the 360 here, and I've got the Book 4 Pro 14 inch. I'm doing a separate review on that. I already did my unboxing and first look. But today we're gonna focus here on this 360. It's a 16 inch, two in one convertible that has a number of changes year over year. We now have the Core Ultra 7 processor. That's the Meteor Lake, the 155H. We now have a touch display on this. It's the dynamic AMOLED 2X display, variable refresh rate up to 120 Hertz, a resolution of 2880 by 1800. It is absolutely gorgeous, it's stunning. This of course supports the S Pen, and it's a thin and a relatively light design for a 16 inch convertible. Uh, but there are some shortcomings here, and it has a heavy price tag, which doesn't really warrant some of the features here. I think they could have lowered the price here, considering they're missing some high-end features. We're going to get into it today. Hey, everybody, it's Andrew, and this is my review of the Samsung Galaxy Book 4 Pro 360, brand new for 2024. Coming up. Now, before we get to the unit itself, I just want to let everyone know in the interest of transparency and full disclosure, I'm not being paid by Samsung. I'm not being sponsored by Samsung. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Samsung is not getting copy approval. That means they're seeing this video for the first time, just like you. Now, this unit was purchased with my own money. This is not a review unit from Samsung. Now, when it comes to pricing, the Book 4 Pro 360 comes in one flavor here. It's a 16-inch variant, two-in-one laptop, 3K AMOLED display, the S Pen included, Intel Arc graphics here, along with that Core Ultra 7 processor, 16 gigabytes of RAM and a terabyte of storage. I'm a little disappointed there is no 32 gigabyte option here, and it comes in at a hefty price tag of $1899.99. For those interested, link will be in the description below. It will be an affiliate link, of course. I will make a small commission with certain certainly helps out the channel. But with that being said, if you want to save some money on this, you can go over to Samsung's website in the link below. And there are some aggressive trade-ins. We know that from Samsung in the past. Here they're offering up to $700 of instant trade-in credit of either a PC, mobile phone, or tablet. If you have something lying around you're not using anymore, why not trade it in? You can get up to $700 depending on the model, of course. That is not a bad deal if you want to save some money at an already expensive price here. So for those interested, link will be in the description below. Now, I've already done my review of the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra. For those that didn't see it, link will be in the description below. And I have my full review of the Galaxy Book 4 Pro 14-inch clamshell. That's up next after this one. So stay tuned and make sure you are subscribed to the channel. You don't want to miss a thing. Now, right off the bat, I wanted to compare the price to the brand new MacBook Air, the 15-inch version that was just released by Apple. That comes in at $1699. That's $200 less than the $1899 price tag we have here on the Book 4 Pro 360. So is it worth the extra $200? We're going to actually find out today. Let's get right to it. You know the drill, folks. Let's get this out of the box. Okay, Galaxy Book 4 Pro 360 here. This, of course, is the convertible version here. It's a 16-inch laptop. We looked at the 14-inch clamshell, so looking forward to getting this one out of the box here, of this inner box. Let's do that. Okay, here's the power charger, and it looks to be a pretty similar to the one we saw on the 14 inch. In fact, I could probably bring that out at some point, but this says super fast charging on it. So that is always good to have fast charging. And then of course you get the unit itself here. Oh wow, this is a little bit of heft on this 16 inch convertible, but look how razor thin this is going to be. We're gonna get this up and running here in a moment. But we also get USB type C cable here to go along with that super fast fast charger and then of course you get some documentation warranty information I'm not gonna bother with that we already looked at that on the 14 inch and then of course you get your S Pen here that's the difference between the laptop version or the clamshell I should say in this convertible this has S Pen support although the 14 inch is touch support this also has S Pen support in it in addition to that I love what the S Pen uh, brings to the table And here it is, and this I believe is also the Moonstone Gray. I'm a big fan of this color. It almost has like a bluish tint to it, but of course the predominant color here is gray, and it just has a really nice look to it. Uh, you can see it here. 
in the different angles here, and I'm really, really loving the color here. Now, I've been using it on the 14 inch. Okay, with just the unit alone, you're looking at 1.677 kilograms or three pounds, 11.1 ounces. Now with the S Pen, with the power charger and the power cord, you're looking at 1.847 kilograms or four pounds, 1.2 ounces all in. Pretty, uh, I would say pretty light for the most part, although it is a pretty uh, substantial two-in-one convertible. It is super thin, but it does have a little bit of weight, and that's not a bad thing. It does have a pretty good substantial feel to it, and that, I think, is gonna give off the premium vibe, and that's certainly what this does. And as you can see, this is heavier than the MacBook Air 15 with the M3 that Apple just released. That is at 1.51 kilograms. This is at 1.677 kilograms. It's also thinner than this laptop. That is 11.5 millimeters thick. This is 12.8 millimeters. Now, to put it size into perspective, on the bottom is the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra with 16.5 millimeters. And then comes the 360 that we have here today. That's 12.8 millimeters. And the smaller sibling that I took a look at, the Galaxy Book 4 Pro 14-inch laptop is 11.6 millimeters thick. And here you can see the thickness with the 14 inch on the bottom there. And of course, the bigger one, the Ultra on the top. And then of course, the 360 in the middle. Now, the first thing you'll notice about the build quality here, it's really excellent. Thin, light, very, very premium materials here. Very little give in the chassis here. I don't see a lot of flex, so I don't really see a lot of give. I don't see a lot of give either or flex on the display. Hardly any keyboard flex. Maybe a little bit, but nothing to be concerned about. All premium metal design here, very high end. And here is the Galaxy Book Pro 14 inch laptop. And as you can see, much smaller than the other two. So you can see the footprint is a lot less, 14 inch versus 16 inch. Now, when it comes to the ports, they're the same as the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra that I just reviewed. On the left side is an HDMI 2.1 port, two USB Type-C Thunderbolt 4 ports that are full function, supporting data, charge, and display out. Now, moving over to the right side is a micro SD card reader, a USB Type-A port, and a 3.5 millimeter microphone headphone combo jack. Now, these are good ports. I'm not complaining here, but the same complaints I had on the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra apply here. I'd like to see a full-size SD card reader, and I'd like to see those two USB Type-C Thunderbolt 4 ports split up, one on each side. Now, to get inside this laptop, just like the Ultra, it's very easy. Remove the four feet. Don't worry. They're easily snapped back on. And then remove the four Phillips head screws. Pry off the bottom plate with a guitar pick, pry tool, or spudger, and you're in. Now, work your way around the edges. Take your time. You don't want to rush it or break anything or bend anything. Now, once inside, you'll notice the two fans for cooling. We'll get into the thermal performance later on in this review. You also notice that 76-watt-hour battery. That's the same size as we saw on the Galaxy Book 4. Ultra. We'll get into the battery life later on as well. Now, there are some key differences in the internals from the Book 4 Pro 360 and the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra. On the 360, there's no vapor chamber cooling as you get on the Ultra, as I showed you in that review as well. Now, the other difference is I don't see a spare or a second SSD slot as you have on the Ultra. That was on the right side there. I don't see it here, although that slot there may be a second SSD. I'm not sure, but uh, if anybody knows, let me know. I'm not really sure about that. And like most laptops here in 2024, the RAM is soldered into the motherboard, not upgradable by the user. Now, this unit has 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5X RAM running in dual channel mode, and it is running at the faster 7467 megahertz. So that is one of the consequences of it running as being soldered in. So that is the silver lining, I would say, of not being able to upgrade it as the user. I still prefer the user to have more choices here and to upgrade it themselves, but that's not what we get here in 2024. 2024. And for those wanting 32 gigabytes of RAM, I didn't see it as an option, at least here in the U.S. on Samsung's website. I'm not sure outside the U.S. if they're going to sell a version with 32 gigabytes of RAM. At least here in the U.S., you have to go with the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra if you want anything above 16 gigabytes of RAM. That would be 32 on the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra as one of the options. Now, as far as the SSD, the SSD is upgradable by the user. It's M.2 NVMe, and as you can see, very good reads and writes, certainly fast enough what you need to do with this laptop. Really good on that front. 
Now, when it comes to wireless, this has a Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.3 combo card that is soldered into the motherboard, not upgradable by the user. And that's unfortunate because this is not Wi-Fi 7, so it's not as future-proof as what other laptops in 2024 are bringing to the table here. That's not the case here with the Samsung. So I'm not sure why they didn't go with Wi-Fi 7. It's the future-proof standard and a little disappointing here to see Wi-Fi 6E, although the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth have been working perfectly fine right now. It's not upgradable and it's not Wi-Fi 7, so not as future-proof. And just like the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra, the star here is going to be the display. It's a 16-inch AMOLED display. They call it the Dynamic AMOLED 2X display with a resolution of 2880 by 1800, and that is a 16 to 10 aspect ratio. It's a touch-enabled display with a variable refresh rate up to 120 hertz. And I got to tell you, it's pretty gorgeous here. It is a glossy display, so depending on your lighting conditions, you will see glare and reflection, but it's not as bad as the previous iteration. So just keep that in mind. They did a good job lessening that here this year in 2024. Now, Samsung claims 400 nits of brightness. I actually measured 411 nits, even better. And it does have excellent coverage of the color gamut. Really good, actually. Color accuracy is spot on here. And with the AMOLED display, you get the deep blacks, the super vibrant colors, the really high contrast. It's all there. So watching movies on Netflix, Amazon, YouTube have been excellent. Doing content creation in Lightroom, Photoshop, video editing in DaVinci Resolve and Premiere Pro has been spot on with this. So it's been really, really good. And just like the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra, this is also touch enabled. Pinch to zoom, navigating the OS with your finger work very well, but this also supports the S Pen, something that the Galaxy Book 4 Ultra doesn't. So having the S Pen is great for taking notes, sketching out artwork, diagrams, and the like. With its 4,096 levels of pressure sensitivity, I thought it was very much like writing on pen to paper. So really, really good in that regard. And the S Pen attaches magnetically to the lid. It's on pretty well there, pretty secure, although I still would put it in a pocket in your bag when traveling. Now this being a two-in-one convertible means, you guessed it, you could put it in the different modes. You've got the laptop mode, which I use 95% of the time, to be honest. Then of course you could put it into the tent mode. This is great for recipes in the kitchen. I would watch movies in this mode or give a presentation, perhaps in a meeting. Same could be said for the stand or presentation mode, right? And then, of course, you could put it into the tablet mode, but I would say as a tablet, this is a little bit heavy for my liking, so I would definitely use it on a table or a desk. That'll work out okay, but I don't use it all that much in tablet mode, to be honest. So this is a camera on the Galaxy Book 4 Pro 360, the 16-inch Convertible laptop here for 2024, 2 megapixel, 1080p camera, it's not IR. You'll have to use the fingerprint scanner to log in with Windows Hello or your password or passcode. Not, not an IR camera, so just keep that in mind. It does have the AI or studio effects. It does have an MPU, so pretty modern in that regard. Uh, works pretty well, but what do you think about the video quality? What do you think about the audio quality? Let me know. Now, for those wondering, here is the auto framing. So if I move out of frame, Let's see if it follows me, and it does. So that uh, works pretty reasonably well here. And then of course you have the eye contact, and then of course the background blur. This is the standard blur, and this is the portrait blur. I think they do a pretty decent job. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Now one thing to note, there is an MPU on this. It is a Meteor Lake laptop, so that will offload a lot of these tasks to that MPU rather than the CPU, GPU, so that is always good. Of course, we hope more applications will take advantage of this uh, later in 2024. Again, I wanna know what you think. Let me know in the comment section below. Now, while the clarity of the camera is really good, in my opinion, there was an issue with the audio. I noticed annoying popping noise. I'm sure you probably picked up on it as well in this video. So I'm not really sure what's going on with that. I tried doing a number of recordings and it still came up with that annoying popping noise. So I'm not sure what the deal is, but uh, hopefully Samsung will issue a fix for it. So that won't be an issue. But right now it's a bit of an annoyance. Yes, you can open the lid with one finger. There's no doubt about it. And the fingerprint scanner, for some reason, is not working properly. I have to re-enter my fingerprint on the system setup here. But even though that was, it was working well before, I think I just have to restart this. Uh, that's one thing I was a little concerned about. 
nothing to be too concerned about. Now, what is it like to type on this keyboard? Well, it's got very shallow key travel, as I mentioned earlier. So that means you're not going to get the most uh, comfortable typing experience, although the feedback and the tactility is decent here. It's good. I just didn't find that the key travel was to my liking here. I kind of wish it was a little bit better. The numpad is here on this 16 inch. Of course, it's also on the Ultra, which also is a 16 inch laptop. The layout may not be the best as far as ca accountants and number crunchers out there. It also moves the trackpad off to the side here. Now, speaking of the trackpad, this is a very big trackpad, maybe unnecessarily big in terms of the size. I don't know why we need such a big trackpad here. Now, the responsiveness, everything is working very well. I didn't have any issues scrolling or doing any adjusters, but at $1,899, yes, a very expensive laptop, why are we not getting a haptic touchpad? Apple does it in their MacBook Pros. HP did it in their Spectre line in the 14 and the 16, good implementation. We know that Sensel made the haptic touchpad on the XPS 14 and 16, at least some of them, we know that for sure. And we know they did it on the X1 Carbon, right? That's coming up as well as the X1 2-in-1. So there's a lot of great implementations in these categories of a haptic touchpad. We're not getting it here on this, the Samsung here. And I don't know why Samsung didn't put a haptic touchpad, especially at this price point. I think it's a missed opportunity. All right, let's talk performance. And this is running the Intel Core Ultra 7 155H, also known as the Meteor Lake processor. And what we're seeing here in 2024, for the most part, is less single core performance and a little bit, or maybe even in the multi-core department. And as you can see here, year over year, we're looking at about 2.8% less performance single core. We're looking at a 15.8% increase multi-core. And when we compared last year's GPU solution, which was the Iris Xe versus this year, Year, we're seeing a 58% increase because the Intel Arc graphics, which this has, are a big step up over the Iris Xe. So this is more or less in line with other Meteor Lake laptops. Now, when we look at the Geekbench 6.2 as compared to others in this category, it didn't do great in that single core performance. That 2345 was not going to be better than some of the last year's laptops we looked at. Certainly not better than the MacBook Pros we looked at. And as far as the multi-core performance, 11,658. You can see more or less in line with other Meteor Lake laptops, maybe a little bit less performance. And I think that has to do with how thin this is and the cooling that is going on here as far as throttling. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, as far as the Cinebench 2024, we're looking at about 12.4% less performance versus the Spectre X360 that I looked at. That got 99 single core. This had 91. And then when you look at the multi-core, it didn't do very well. I think we're seeing throttling here, 53.4%. 0.5% less performance than the Spectre X360 16 inch. And by the way, that had a bug in it. So we're not seeing quite the scores we should be seeing. Hopefully HP will issue that fix very soon and it will rerun the test. But even so, we're seeing less performance here on the Samsung Galaxy Book 4 Pro 360. And when I ran the Cinebench 2023 to compare to last year's model, this did 1589. That's about 5.6% less single core performance. And it got 38.2% increased performance multi-core. Again, more in line what we're seeing here with Meteor Lake processors for 2024. Now, even though we're not seeing better single core performance or even great multi-core performance here, we are seeing a better graphics performance, and that certainly helps year over year. We're seeing about a 93.7% increase in the Time Spy score. And when we look at the Fire Strike score, you're looking at nearly 60% better performance. And that means if you want to play games, you can certainly play some of the more popular titles if you lower the settings. That, of course, will give you playable frame rates. If you want to do video editing in DaVinci Resolve, you can, even 4K video editing, although I would keep it at a simple project. I wouldn't get too complicated with too many graphics transitions and all kinds of effects. I would stay away from that. And then, of course, if you want to do other things with this, that certainly helps having better graphics. The overall takeaway is with this improved graphics, you certainly could do more on this laptop, even though we're not seeing a huge CPU performance increase here. Now, I will be doing a review of the MacBook Air 15 with a new M3 processor from Apple, and you're seeing better single-core and multi-core performance by the MacBook Air over this Galaxy Book 4 Pro 360. Not a big difference in the multi-core, but a pretty big difference, I think, in the single-core performance.
And the same could be said pretty much for the Cinebench R24. We're seeing a much better single-core performance and a similar multi-core, although still better on the MacBook Air 15 from these initial results. So we'll talk more about that very soon. Now, when I ran the Time Spy stress test to see if this will thermal throttle, it got a score of 92.7%, meaning it detected a little bit of throttling here, and that's not too unexpected in such a thin chassis. So the heat is maybe having a little bit trouble dissipating here, although 92.7% is not terrible. We've seen worse in other laptops, so it maintained pretty good rates in terms of the frame rates that it, when it tested that, but again, a little bit of throttling detected here. Again, not too unexpected. Now, when it comes to the surface temperatures, I have good news here. It never got overly hot. The only place where it starts to get a little bit warm is above the keyboard, below the display where the vents are, where it dissipates in terms of the heat, getting around, again, 43 degrees Celsius there. But where you place your fingers on the keyboard, as you can see, doesn't get overly hot. And that's good news here when placed under heavy load. Now, on the underside here, I did notice it get around 45 degrees or so Celsius uh, on the top there, again, where the vents are more or less a little bit below that as well and that was not too concerning never getting overly hot in the most part for this so overall the surface temperatures remain cool even under load now the good news is as far as fan noise is concerned it was not much of an issue even under maximum load never going above 42 decibels or so so that means you're not gonna have to contend with annoying fan noise for the most part when I put it in the optimized mode or the silent mode it wasn't an issue at all so the overall takeaway is good job in terms of keeping it relatively cool and quiet. But where we're seeing a big difference year over year is going to be battery life. Indeed, we're seeing really big numbers here. And that's thanks to the Intel Core Ultra 7 here, the Meteor Lake processor, which is a more efficient processor than the Core i7-1360P that we had last year. This got 13 hours and 37 minutes on the PC Mark 10 Modern Office test. It did nearly 15 hours on the video playback. Compare that to last year's model, which did 7 hours and 58 minutes on the PC Mark 10 Modern Office test and the video playback test. It did 9 hours and 27 minutes. These are pretty significant gains. And keep in mind, when I ran the test, I put it into balance mode, set the brightness to 40%, all these are set the same way and I ran it at the full 120 hertz both models so when you're going to be looking at this expect even better battery life if you bump it down to the dynamic refresh rate in this year or even to do 60 hertz from last year or this year you're going to get better battery life but my overall takeaway is we're seeing a big significant increase in endurance year over year <laughs> Okay, let's bring it all home. What do I think about the Samsung Galaxy Book 4 Pro 360 here in 2024? I have mixed feelings here. On the one hand, we get a really nice dynamic AMOLED 2X display, which is simply stunning. We get massive battery life improvements over the Galaxy Book 3 Pro 360 from last year. We get pretty decent quad speakers here, although not quite as good as the MacBook Pro. We got faster RAM here running at 74, 67 megahertz. We get a pretty sharp 2 megapixel 1080p webcam and we get nice seamless integration with the Galaxy devices. And that's where things start to fall apart. We get less single core performance than last year. The RAM is soldered into the motherboard, not upgradable by the user. You get a micro SD card reader, which is fine, although I do prefer a full-size SD card reader on a 16-inch laptop. You have Wi-Fi 6E, not Wi-Fi 7. And to make matters worse, the Wi-Fi card is soldered into the motherboard, so you can't even upgrade it even if you wanted to. 
So again, not future proof. No IR camera for Windows Hello login. It has shallow key travel. It has some screen wobble. There's no haptic touchpad at $18.99. That's a really uh, a crime here. I can't believe they didn't put a haptic touchpad here. There's no 32 gigabyte option, although it is listed as being a 32 gigabyte option, at least here in the US on Samsung's website. There is no option there, at least not yet. And it comes in at $1,899, which to me is overpriced for what you're getting. Even the new MacBook Air 15 with the M3 processor comes in $200 cheaper than this laptop. But don't get me wrong, this is still a good laptop, just too many missed opportunities once again from Samsung. So please hit the like button, please subscribe, please share this video. Don't forget to leave a comment in that comment section below. Let me know how I'm doing. Let me know if there's a device or something out there you think I should review. I'll do my best to try to make that happen. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. And don't forget to check out my website, amdtechreviews.com. So until next time, this is Andrew, and I'll see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.